Japan Station is made possible in part by Patreon support. If you would like to make sure that I can keep bringing you more content like this, then head on over to japankyo.com slash Patreon and sign up for as little as $1 a month. Welcome to Japan Station, a production of japankyo.com. I'm your host, Tony Vega. So the other day I was on the Japankyo Twitter account at Japankyo News if you want to go follow uh, over there. But um, I was there just looking around for interesting stories and I happened to come across a very interesting story which was uh, about an individual that had trained several years in sumo in Japan and then afterwards had gone on to become a PhD candidate over at the University of Cambridge in the UK and he was doing research on sumo and other uh, physical activities, uh, for lack of a better word, sports in the Heian period. Uh, So I was completely intrigued by this individual with this very unique background and very unique story and research. And so I decided to email him. And thankfully, I got in touch with him and he agreed to be on the show. And you're going to get to hear the conversation that I had with him. So today you're going to get to hear a conversation that I had with Colton Runyon. So Colton is originally from the U.S., but as I said, he trained in sumo in Japan and now is a Ph.D. candidate at the University of Cambridge. So we're going to get to talk about his training in Japan and his experiences in sumo in Japan, as well as his very interesting research. Uh, By the way, uh, a couple of names are going to come up that some of you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, The first of which is Konishiki. So Konishiki is a very, very well-known sumo wrestler from Hawaii competed in professional sumo in Japan, made it to the second highest rank of Ozeki. And then at the end of the conversation, the name Kenna Heffernan also comes up. He is a U.S. uh, national uh, sumo champion, and Colton has competed alongside him as part of the U.S. national team. Kenna is also from Hawaii, so I got to meet both of them and interview them, so that's why the names come up. But anyway, let's get to it. Here is my conversation with... Colton Runyon. The next stop is Japan Station. The doors on the right side will open. So, um, all right, I, I guess I have to start with the the question that you've probably been asked that like a million times, but sure. so how, how did you get into sumo? Uh, <clears throat> well, the f- hmm, where to start with that? I guess the easiest way to start is <laughs> yeah. um, I moved to Japan after I finished my bachelor's uh, yeah. when I was 20 years old. And I, was, I moved to Akita, Japan. Mm-hmm. And up in Akita, uh, I was teaching English through the JET program, which is a pretty common mm-hmm. way for recent graduates to get over to Japan to teach English, which I did move over there because of a great interest in their history. And Mm -hmm. I was a teacher already at that point as well. So I thought I'd mix Mm. the two things together. But anyway, while I was there, uh, the JET community or like the assistant language teachers community was quite active in charity. And one of the charity Mm -hmm. events that they came up with is to have a foreign charity sumo tournament. Well, that's interesting. That's, that's pretty unique. It is. Yes. So mm-hmm. obviously, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of the jets or a lot of the ALTs, the teachers up there would be interested in donning a Mawashi for the first time, or maybe only the second or third time and uh-huh. wrestling on an actual proper dohyo and everything in a, in a proper, oh. um, <clears throat> in a proper building. But the main po- purpose of it was so that we could sell tickets so people could come enjoy watching us do this sure and make some money for charity um so it's not a legitimate comp you know competition in that we're fighting for anything or like it's going to normally lead to anything uh however i take all competitions quite seriously i'm I'm (laughs) (laughs) i'm a big gamer and a big sports player so I was really excited for this idea because I'd never done it before. I'd never actually done any form of wrestling, and I was really excited to to do so. And so that first tournament I did, that would have been 2010, I think. 2010 or 11. I'm getting too old. I can't remember. (laughs) Um, 
but you know, we all traveled to the capital, which is Akita City, and and in Akita mm-hmm. City, where we had this competition, everyone donned their mawashis, everyone was doing uh, these various exercises. We even had a professional wrestler there. I don't remember his name. He was not in uh, the upper ranks at that point. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. He was walking us through how to do the various exercises, like shiko mm-hmm. and, and suriyashi. Mm-hmm. And then we did the competition. And uh, for one reason or another, I won the competition. Mm-hmm. And I was quite excited from that. Um, that gave me quite a bit of confidence. And I decided, you know what? I kind of like this thing. Uh, <laughs> I kind of like this sumo thing. Because sumo yeah. is is this really interesting spot in between sport and martial art. So uh-huh. I, I obviously did the whole, you know, American boy thing of did one year of baseball, one year of basketball, one year of soccer. Uh, my mother uh-huh. wouldn't let me play football, which was probably the un- the unfortunate part of my childhood because I skipped a few grades. So she was worried about my body size and my head getting injured uh-huh. in a contact sport like that. Uh, uh-huh. Then I also tried martial arts as well. Uh, uh-huh. Did some Kempo karate, uh, tried Kendo for about two classes, did Kudo for about I think it was one class, and then I just kind of, okay, you know, martial arts isn't really working for me. Team sports aren't really working for me right now, but sumo is kind of this beautiful spot in the middle of the two things. Uh-huh. And I was There's hooked on it ever since. Competition, very physical, but it's also like you're by yourself, but when you're training, you're training with others. Is it this kind of like nice hybrid of various things that... that- appeal to you yeah it's it's a great hybrid because it mm-hmm. has it has the martial arts sense to it in that mm-hmm. uh the, the purpose of it is for you to get stronger with each day and like as you practice this and you go through these very repetitive movements you do actually mm-hmm. feel yourself becoming stronger with each day but because it's an individual sport you're mm-hmm. it's very easy for you to uh quantify and qualify your progress like, mm. you know, last week I won, and this is this would be an accurate number, I won zero of the 100 matches I had, and mm-hmm. this week I won one. So progress, you know, yeah. and that's kind of how you progress through the sport is, I mean, you get, uh, you get beat over and over and over and over until eventually you learn how to not be beat as often. Mm-hmm. And in the particular mm-hmm. place where I did my best sumo, which was at uh, Nihon University, they what they would do is they'd have me wrestle the same guy every single day and you know he'd beat me 10 times out of 10 we mm-hmm. just do 10 matches straight in a row and then eventually when i could beat him you know i'd beat him I would, i'd lose all 10 and then a couple weeks later i'd get two wins here maybe three wins and a couple weeks later i'm beating him six seven times wow. and as soon as i could uh-huh. beat him more than he could beat me they moved me to another guy Cool. <laughs> yeah. So you yeah, just. No, I mean, just... that's that's like such a simple way to see the progress. Yeah. Exactly right. Mm-hmm. So, it, and I think sumo kind of sits in a very like it. It's different than anything else I've ever seen, in that it's the way you do the progress is actually competing. Like you have to, we do matches over and over and over, as opposed to kata. But you're not uh... having to worry about you know the score or Mm -hmm. team dynamics or coaching or anything like that. So I think that's kind of how it's a hybrid of all those ideas. True. Yeah. 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 Um, All right. So then after you win the the charity uh, event, then where do you go from there? How did you continue training? So (laughs) the first place I trained was actually at um, one of the fellow, one of my fellow teachers. She taught at a, a middle school that Mm -hmm. had a sumo team uh and the team had three coaches and only two students Uh so but they had a dohyo sitting right there right next to the bike rack at the middle school so Uh twice a week i would drive it was about i think it was about an hour and a half i would drive out there and do practice and uh, the coaches there were gracious enough to give me quite a bit of attention Mm -hmm. and So I learned a lot of the fundamentals uh, there. Obviously, my opponents were middle school children, so it wasn't really – although I'll tell you, in the the beginning, the better one, he beat me all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it just takes a few weeks. Humbling. It was. Oh, it certainly was. Uh, Sumo is a very humbling sport, which is probably Uh why I need some more of it. 
but <laughs> um yeah it's 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 very much a sport where it's about overcoming um loss like you have to uh-huh. lose over and over and, and that's what that's what they want like it's and for me i would say it was highly motivating in that regard uh, uh. That that is that is a nice thing about uh, like you know I I did jet as well and so oh, okay. you, know, you get to do these little experiences and sometimes participate in certain clubs that yeah. I don't know, I get the feeling that sometimes in the U S you know things are a lot stricter but they they'll let you kind of join in and do these things that maybe in other places you might not be able to so that's that's pretty nice indeed I I was quite like one of the shocking moments for me was obviously you know your listeners that know about sumo you're wearing mm-hmm. just a mawashi. Yeah. Right. And I have no problems with that on a normal stage. But the very first time I got there, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm I'm a foreign English teacher who's going <laughs> to be just in a Mawashi right next to the bike racks for every single one of these students <laughs> who don't know me because this isn't the school I teach at. Yeah. And, and we're in rural, rural Japan. So this isn't like, oh, yeah, okay, there, there's another white guy who's doing sumo. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but no one, no one really paid any mind. Uh-huh. Which I was quite surprised because they pay mine. I remember, you know, someone coming up to me when I was in the grocery store and they're like, I didn't know you liked bananas as I was buying bananas. <laughs> like that wasn't important. But when I'm doing sumo, they go, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. He's doing sumo. It's oh, perfectly of course fine. he likes sumo. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, it was really, nice. it's really interesting. <laughs> All right. So, um, like so, okay. So then you you eventually, like I said, you you do train at Nihon University, but yeah. uh, what, was that after you finished Jet? Yeah, but uh, after Jet, the first thing I did is I went back to the U.S. Uh, and I taught there for two years. I was teaching high school, and I taught. Um, I also in the evenings after my I was teaching classes on history, I would teach my brother and some of my his uh high school students who were interested in sumo to do sumo and then i used that oh. as my training regiment and nice. it was through that that i was able to continue my training and eventually get on to uh national championships at the u.s and get myself on a few national teams and oh, then i okay. uh, i went to cali colombia for the world games mm-hmm. and uh, I, I i got my butt beat like it, it, it wasn't pretty <laughs> So then when I was on the team again for the next world championship, I decided I was going to go back to Japan mm-hmm. and I was going to get some proper uh, training in because I thought, why don't I really give this a shot? Because, you know, you can teach when you're 40, but you can't really do sumo when you're 40. I mean, you can, mm-hmm. but you're not going to be as good as you are when you're sure. 24. Mm-hmm. So um, <clears throat> I worked through the U.S. Sumo Federation, the USSF to train at Nichidai at Nihon University. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to only be there for two weeks, but I bought a one-way ticket for one. (laughs) And uh, a few days into it, they're like, hey, you want to stay longer? And I said, Uh yes, I do. And I I ended up training with them for, like every day I trained with them for just under a a year. And then Uh I unfortunately had to, get a job as well and balance that. But yeah, I was, I was with Nichi Dai in some capacity for just, uh, just shy of a year and a half. Oh, okay. So it was that the point then when you, uh, met Konishki? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. I mean, and, and, no, I, I think I was actually done with Nichi Dai at that point oh, or I was, okay. or I was near the end of that. Uh-huh. Um, it, all that time's a blur, you know, I was, I was hitting my head sure. against things every single day. Training, <laughs> training, training. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I met him on a couple different occasions. Um, uh-huh. <clears throat> a wonder, wonderful guy and yeah. a, a phenomenal storyteller. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had the opportunity to interview him here and yeah, I had plenty to talk to him about. Indeed. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So, so, but you also participated in tournaments while you were there, right? Yeah, I participated in a few. Uh, obviously, mm-hmm. I, I was still part of the national team, so mm-hmm. I would go to world championships, world games, that sort of thing. I mm-hmm. also went to a couple opens, like I went to uh, an open in Poland representing the U.S. And then I also, this would be later, uh, when I, I did my master's at Saitama University. Mm-hmm. And when I was there, I was captain of the sumo team for one year. Wow. And... That year, I represented – I was the only representative because I was captain of the team 
you know, by default. Because I was, because <laughs> the 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 first year I got there, there were three of us and one guy who actually went pro, and then uh-huh. the next year there were none of us except for me. So I mean, that's gotcha. kind of how, okay, how cool. that works. It's not like anyone gave me a vote of confidence or anything. At least they didn't <laughs> close the club, I guess. Yeah, but I was able to participate in the all the all Kanto um, college tournament. Uh-huh. Uh, we we didn't have a team, obviously, so we couldn't do the team competition, which is what the colleges care the most about, but I did wrestle as a, an independent wrestler from Saitama university and which was the first time I ever fought well, first and only time I ever fought on the Koko Gikan's dojo. Oh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and how did that go? Oh, I got, I got beat pretty handedly. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the guy had pretty long arms. So I have quite short arms. Um, uh-huh. and he just got a, got some leverage. I couldn't get a hold of his belt. I'm, I'm, I'm a belt or chest kind of guy. I, n- I need you up close and personal. And, mm-hmm, and he mm-hmm. kept me a bit at distance and that was it. Yeah. 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 Huh. So what you mean like first round, like how does that work? Yeah. Yeah. So the way, the way that the individual tournament works is they actually work all the way up to the all Kanto champion and mm-hmm. it, it's a single elimination tournament mm, so okay, you know okay. i i, I wrestle i i don't remember the university he came from um mm-hmm. <clears throat> solid wrestler uh, he he mm-hmm. won a couple more matches which i appreciated mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um but you know it, it's not like like when i did the world championships uh the one in taiwan and then one in poland in both cases i lost to gold which was heartbreaking because mm-hmm. you'd rather be gold yourself but <laughs> <laughs> at, at the all conto you know it it I I didn't get the I don't know if it's a if it's a blessing or a curse to go up against one of the guys who wins those things because the people who win those are like um uh, oh I forget what his rikshi name is now I just know him as Daiki I, uh-huh. I know I, I know his actual name <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> oh Hokuto Fuji um, oh, okay so you know wrestlers like I mean big strong imposing guys. So essentially, so some of those guys then move on to the professional uh, division. Indeed. In fact, Nihon okay. University is quite famous for some people call it the factory because mm. it's it's able to constantly produce uh, wrestlers. They may not make it all the way up to Makunuchi, but mm-hmm. they they have a career in sumo. Mm. Okay. Okay. Because, okay. uh, uh, of course, like. So at least, well, when when you start to research this, you know, you hear about, um, you know, they they join the stable at a young age, and it's mm. not that they go through the university, but they kind of end up spending, you know, their teen years in working their ways up, way up the the kind of sumo ladder. But there's also this other way in, it seems. Indeed, yeah. I mean, the traditional mm-hmm. way is to join right after junior high, and for some cases, and you you do actually go. There are special schools. You, there are like feeder schools. So, mm. uh, like the wrestlers I wrestled with at Nihon University, they all went to the same high school and the same junior high school. Oh, okay. right. Wh- which is, and they're um, like, so at the junior high school, many of my teammates were also teammates with Ichinojo, who mm-hmm. did not go the school route, but went the, I'm just going to go professional route. So, like, there's very specific schools you can go to. There's one, I think the junior high school is in Totori, actually. And oh, uh-huh. they they all practice there, and I think after that's when they determine you need to go pro immediately, or you can go the university route. But it's still, I mean, I I don't know a whole. I went to the University of Texas, so I know people on the football team. You know, mm. they, they they get specialized treatment, whatever kind that is. I'm not entirely mm. sure. Sure. Um, and the Nihon University sumo team had much the same because they, it's really hard to balance. Training is so, such a draining exercise. It takes out yeah. so much of you. And training, particularly for sumo, is, and I'm comparing this to other sports that I've done, mm-hmm. especially at Nihon University. Like they, they train, in my limited opinion, harder than professionals do. Mm-hmm. And and it's every day. I mean, it's mm-hmm. seven days a week, and you take maybe one or two days off. Like like New Year's, you're at yeah. home with your families, but you're you're back to practice in early January. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's tough. It's a tough schedule to try to balance a full course load, or in right. my case, a full a full workload, mm-hmm. and these practices that just take everything out of you. What is there any? 
exercise or aspect of the regiment that particularly, um, how can I put it, that you particularly disliked? <laughs> <sighs> that I disliked, you know, no, actually the thing uh -huh. that I, I disliked the most, but I completely understand why it's there is uh -huh. when, so the first thing you do is you do, and depending on where you are, it's either a hundred, 200, or even 500 skull, right? Which is just the leg raises just up and down, up and down. That can be quite um, monotonous. However, yeah. it does, it, it, it stretches your legs out. It gets you to sweat and you're breathing. Like people look at it, oh, it's not that hard. Then you get people mm -hmm. who've never really practiced it. After about 20, they're like, no, my legs are on fire. And it's like, <laughs> oh, sure yeah. You well, start cramping up too. <laughs> you do. And it's like, oh, yeah. we, st we still have 10 times as many of these, right? You, yeah. you need to keep going. And it's what gets, it's what gives these wrestlers those really powerful thighs. Yeah. Um, and then the Suryash, all, all, all the Butskari, every exercise has a very important purpose. But after mm -hmm. we've done all the, let's say, Warm up exercises, which you're doing for like a half hour, you then do matches. And mm -hmm. when you do matches, the captains or your highest ranking wrestlers or what have you, um, in, in the Nihon, Nihon University sphere, which is where I practice the most, those mm -hmm. captains would wrestle first. And whoever wins the match stays in the ring. So it's a king of the ring kind of system. And oh. then everyone else kind of puts up their hands like, oh, you know, pick me next, pick me next. And the wrestler in question who just won, who, of course, in the beginning is, is the better wrestler, he's only going to pick a really good opponent. And mm -hmm. the reason why he's going to pick a really good opponent, although I was never actually told this verbatim, but I, I do. This is what I gleaned from it anyway. Sure. Is one, you need to fight someone around your level because that's how you get better at it. But sure. two, if you lose to someone who's beneath you, you're going to lose some level of credibility as one of the top <laughs> dogs. And this is sure, yeah. this is an incredibly, incredibly competitive sport. That's what people yeah. really don't like your main when you practice every single day, your opponents are your teammates. Yeah. And as much as we are a team outside the facility and, and everyone fully gets on the team once you're outside the facility, inside you are jockeying for position. You want to be one of the top dogs there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So any sign of weakness is um, verboten. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah. the, so back back to the thing that as you can see sometimes I deviate. Um, That's okay. Yeah. One of the thing that I disliked the most is when they were choosing, they wouldn't choose me because I wasn't very good. Right. I, I was one of the worst there. I mean, these guys have been doing sumo their entire lives. I've been doing sure, it a yeah. couple years. Like, why would they pick uh -huh. me? Because losing yeah. to me would be terrible although they definitely weren't going to lose and wrestling me what, what do you get out of that i mean i'm too easy yeah. to beat so i would have to wait throughout the whole practice and like when guys do a few matches they'll go okay i'm done and then and then you know the the higher ranked guys they'll leave and then the middle ranked guys will fight and again everyone's raising their hand hey you know pick me pick me and, and i'm doing it every time from from the high ranked guy to, to the low ranked guy pick me pick me and of course every time it's no 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 and I remember, actually, there was one captain in particular. He and I got along very well. Mm -hmm. um, one day, he, he, he saw a look on my face. So afterwards, he asked me, he's like, you know, what's, what's wrong? And I said, well, you know, I'm just getting really frustrated with I keep putting my hand up and no one will pick me until it's the very, very last person. And we're talking mm -hmm. like we go through over 20 guys and sure. every person has like I'm being picked last every single day. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he sat with me and he said, look, I, I understand how you feel. I had the same thing when I was younger and I was new mm -hmm. to the team. But mm -hmm. you show this on your face and no one's going to respect you. You can't wow. be in there expecting matches when you need to practice more. So what you need to do is be constantly enthusiastic and you will get your chance. And when you get your chance, hit the guy harder than he thinks you're going to. <laughs> and then uh -huh. you'll get more opportunities. Yeah. Huh. That's, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's nice. <laughs> I mean, that's really encouraging, right? It is. Yeah. It, it, it was yeah. excellent advice. And, you know, I think yeah. there's certain advice that's very particular to sumo because uh -huh. it's a very particular activity. Yeah. Um, 
and they, they kind of mix together the ultra competitiveness. I mean, it's a very, very competitive dog eat dog kind of world, but also everyone's mm-hmm. in it together because they care so much about the sport. So I, I, I mm-hmm. had a lot of gracious help from a lot of my mm-hmm. teammates. It was, it was a very great learning experience. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. Um, so then what, what about like the, the academic side of things? Cause sure. you know, I know your research touches on, on that on, on Sumo as well, but so how, where, where did the transition happen? What, what led you to where you are now at Cambridge? Okay. So what I just, dis- I got to a point where my visa required that I was teaching English. Um, mm-hmm. I, I had actually kind of thought about going professional, uh, mm-hmm. but my age, my age was too high. I was sure. at that point, I was 25. And mm-hmm. in order to go professional as a foreigner, you need to be under the age of 20. Oh, I or know. you need a world title. And of oh, course, wow. I, I was I, I had three shots at it. Um, and I think I had a pretty decent shot at winning in Poland. However, I did not. And that was kind mm-hmm. of my last chance. And mm-hmm. when that was over, I was like, okay, um, I, I need to move on. Uh, like I, I need mm-hmm. something else in my life. Uh, at the time I just met my now ex-wife and I was like, okay, mm-hmm. I, ne- I need to start doing something else with my life rather than pursuing this sports career that I don't think is going to happen. Sure. And, and so I went and decided to do a master's at Saitama university, uh, where I studied, mm-hmm. uh, sumo stories from the Heian period in literature mm. and then from that i went to i was like i i always wanted to be a professor I, I i was a teacher for 10 years like i've always loved education i've always loved teaching and even when i was a mm. kid i thought about being a professor um mm. then when i did my master's at saitama my supervisor there carl friday is a titan of our field mm. and so you know, I was able to learn so much from him about how to do this professionally, and it gave me a lot mm-hmm. of confidence. And then I eventually applied to the University of Cambridge and made it here, too, where I work with um, Mickey Adolfson, who is also a titan of our field. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I was able to transition quite easily from practicing on the dohyo to reading about it. Yeah, that's awesome. I and mean, you're the toughest PhD candidate. <laughs> 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 There's not that be. many that have your unique background. <laughs> no, I suppose not. No. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. But, you know, hey, breaking stereotypes and learning from all different aspects. It's just wonderful stuff. So sure. I love it. Um, all right. So then, then can you tell us kind of what your focus is right now? Because it, it was very interesting what I, what I read about and I wanted to learn a little bit more about it. Sure. So what mm-hmm. my research looks at, the, the thesis of it, is uh, mm-hmm. the importance – socially, politically, and economically of physical competitions during the Heian period. And by physical competitions, okay. I mean sumo, horse racing, and archery. And the Heian period goes roughly from the 9th century to the 12th century, though I mainly look at the 10th and 11th centuries, which corresponds with something known as Ochokoka, which is a period of uh, where the regents and the courtiers hold the most power. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of competition in between those courtiers for the different positions and different levels of influence within the court. And during this time, these physical competitions also corresponded. Uh, they, they played a major function with, within the society. Mm-hmm. And to my knowledge, no one has studied them together like this. So mm. it's um, mm. <clears throat> it, and it's really fascinating to me because I'm, 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 I'm a sports addict. So mm-hmm. I'm able to read 1,000 year old sport records, which is really cool. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's really fun. But it's also yeah. really important work because they, uh-huh. at least they thought so. Because uh, there's an online database through the Historiographical Institute of the University of Tokyo, which, if anyone's interested in pre-modern Japanese history, that's the place to go because they've digitized mm-hmm. all these records from oh, the Heian wow. period. And uh-huh. just looking through that database of my various uh, physical competitions that I look at, there's nearly 3,000 entries over mm-hmm. the span of a couple hundred years. And if something was written down 3,000 times in a time period when not a lot of stuff was written down, it's important. Mm-hmm. You know, it, yeah. it, it, it has it has an importance. So I pretty much just look at that and I just code through and I read all these records and try to glean the importance therein. Mm-hmm. 
So, I mean, obviously you're still doing the research and, and you know, there, you, well, these kinds of things you can keep going and going and going, yeah. but, um, what, what can you tell us about like some of the importance of sumo or, you know, archery or, um, what, what, uh, horse racing, I think, right? Yes. Well, yeah. Yeah. Those three. Yeah. yeah. What can you tell us about that from what you've, you've seen so far? Sure. Well, I just actually gave a presentation last week on so oh, okay. talking about sumo here. Um, mm -hmm. The there's a tournament in 1013, mm -hmm. uh, and there, there there was an annual tournament during the Heian period where they would bring in wrestlers from the provinces to the capital in order to wrestle, and that in and mm -hmm. of itself is already quite unique because these are not courtiers who are being allowed into the um, the the palace inside. The, the city of Kyoto, which was called Heian Kyo at the time. Mm -hmm. And they're able to wrestle. And some of them, based on how well they wrestle, they actually end up having a good relationship with these courtiers. So you have a guy mm -hmm. who's from Echu, way mm -hmm. out in the provinces, out in the sticks in one way or another, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. has a direct line of communication with the minister of the right, who is the third most powerful man in the court sort of mm -hmm. thing. And, and it, it's it's really – anyway, so the, the 1013 tournament, in this particular case, this was during um, the reign of Emperor Sanjo, but more importantly, this is during the time when the courtier Michinaga, uh, Fujiwara no Michinaga is at the height of his power. And for mm -hmm. anyone that knows the Heian period, he's arguably the most powerful man of the Heian period. Very, mm -hmm. very powerful courtier. And the two of them are kind of jostling for position at court because Emperor Sanjo actually wants to use some of his own influence and <clears throat> the problem is that emperor sanjo has uh, he's been he's been struck well at this point he's not blind yet but he's he's progressively losing his eyesight mm. and he you know he's he's feeling a little desperate so what he does is he goes down to ise grand shrine which of course is a sh the shrine for amaterasu who is the mm -hmm. You know, he is a descendant of Amaterasu. So he's going to his, his family shrine there and he prays at the shrine that if he's to keep his, his position as emperor, that at the sumo tournament that was going to happen in a couple days, th the wrestlers of the left, because they're separated into left and right, the wrestlers of the left will win the first three matches. So mm -hmm. what that means is that the emperor was betting his, position as emperor on a sumo tournament hmm. uh -huh. right or of course look or like looking for not betting in like a modern sense but the looking for a divine sign through this competition sure and when the tournament happens the first three matches actually go the emperor's way and the emperor's at least from the way i read it is invigorated by by this happening and actually tells um <clears throat> tells a couple close um, a couple of courtiers he's close to in court that uh, about the uh, the prayer that he had, and they you know they write down they have their own comments about it, and it even gets its way to a wrestler, and then the wrestler makes a comment on it. And what what this whole story means here is one you have the leader of a the divine leader of a country who actually at this point is the government rather than an agent of the government. Mm -hmm. who is riding on sumo as a way to to bring some validity to his seat because he's worried about losing it. You have wrestlers who are, again, guys who come from the provinces, and he learns about the emperor's wishes, and then he gets to comment on it, which is just unheard of. Yeah. You, you wouldn't have... I mean, for lack of a better term, or the way they'd look at it, like peasants. I mean, just like people, just yeah. like you are not a courtier. You are outside our box. Right. And and he not only gets to hear the emperor's wish, but he comments on it. And then this guy who's minister of the right will eventually become minister, right? At this point, he's just um, the head of the guards of the right, writes it mm -hmm. down in his diary. So you have, again, like this is kind of, you have the political, the social, and then economically, some wrestlers, including this wrestler I just talked about, he would receive untaxed land from the capital because of his performance in sumo. And then they also mm. received rewards if they performed well and based on their position, which their position, their rank was based on how well they would normally perform. So they were, that's the economic aspect of that. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, so that's and, and that's just one example. I mean, there's there's so many, but it's kind of uh, the way that I conceptualize everything is I use all these different examples to show how it ties into the political, social, economic with like horse racing, for example, with Fujiwara no Michinaga. He was obsessed with horse racing. The very mm-hmm. first record we have of him talking about a residence that he inherits is that he builds a, a horse track. That's the very oh. first record of, of that house that, 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 or that estate that he inherits. Mm-hmm. He says, I built a horse track there. And for the, oh. for the rest of his life, at least, he holds I'm mean, constantly, like every few months, he's holding horse races at his private residence. And then all the courtiers and even the emperor will come and visit to watch the horse racing which is a way for him to show his power at court. One, it shows his wealth because he's the, these are his horses. He actually inherit or he receives a bunch of horses from the governors out in the provinces. Mm. In fact, at the time that he died, he still had a hundred horses that were like in his stables, which is quite a large amount of horses to have sitting. I yeah. mean, you know, Kyoto's not very big, um, yeah, but yeah. he would also move them around and, during during his well it's hard to call it a reign but while he is a member of the court horse trading as a form of well for a nice word would be gift a more cynical word would be a bribe mm-hmm. uh, shoots up like everyone's trading in horses essentially once he dies that ends like it just stops mm. but <clears throat> yeah. anyway he would put on these lavish parties and it would show his wealth, um, the fact that everyone had to come to his house to do it. And that's one of the ways in which I think he shows I am the man in Kyoto, right, right. not the emperor. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. In archery, archery is a little more difficult because sumo and horse racing are, are two very particular events. Well, there are many forms of archery. So there was there was ceremonial archery, which was uh, it was done on the it's in the middle of the first month of the year, and it it is not a competition. It's it's actually one historian thinks it's a way of showing um, deference to the emperor. So the courtiers mm-hmm. show deference to the emperor every year, and I happen to agree with her. And then there's other forms. Um, there's kisha, which is equestrian archery which was also mm-hmm. normally part it was normally after horse racing and then there's noriyumi and there's a really great story in uh, kagoro niki which is it translates in english as the gossamer years and gossamer is a lovely word um mm-hmm. <clears throat> which is a diary written by a the wife of fuji well not wife uh, the concubine the second wife right. whatever you like to, not the primary wife mm-hmm. of fujiwara no kaneie who is a regent and okay. and this diary goes through the 960s 970s 980s and during this time period Kaneie is just a major counselor so he's 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 high but he's not he's not top dog yet mm-hmm. so he actually brings some of his some of the guards under his employ to her house to train in archery and then mm. she, she unfortunately is never there because she wouldn't be invited to such a thing as being the not primary wife. And then also quite a few of the – some of the events, women were present. Some of them, they were not. I'm mm-hmm. still needing to do a bit more research on that. Um, but in her case, she was not invited, but her son would go, and then she would talk about it. And mm-hmm. they went to this to this tournament, and when they came back – Kaneie is super excited because his archers win when they're not supposed to. And he says that uh, he gained a lot of reputation at court because of mm. this. And then his son, uh, de- if you won or lost, would determine whether you did a certain dance. There was a winner's dance and a loser's dance. Mm-hmm. And the son had practiced the winner's dance, even though they weren't supposed to win. So <laughs> when they when they went to this tournament and they won, the son did this dance and the emperor really liked it. And even he got more clout. Right? <laughs> it's like reminds me of like Fortnite or something. <laughs> it, 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 exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. So anyway, oh. th- th- there's just countless stories like that of each one, and, uh-huh. and, and they'll either tie into the political, the social, the economic, or all three. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's really interesting. Um, I, I got a quick follow-up question. Sure. But, um, especially when it comes to horse racing, when you hear horse racing nowadays, right? You hear, you think K-Bot, you think gambling. Yes. Um, do, do, you, in the, do the records show that there was any kind of gambling going on with these sports? <sighs> Not gam. I mean, with with most things in the pre modern, it's you you'd have to say yes, but no, because mm-hmm. it, it it is, but it isn't like it is today. Like one of the major oh. things when, when someone looks at like what I do, they're like, that's one of the reasons why I call it a physical competition and not a sport, mm-hmm. is because as soon as you hear sport, you go, well, modern sports, and it's like if I say it's competitive, mm-hmm. oh well, then that means it's fair, and it's like no, it's not fair <laughs> in the way that sports are today. You know, yeah. th- th- there are cases like the emperor just changes. It's like, oh, did the right one? I ah, choose the left to win. <laughs> you know, it's, so it, right, so right. Uh, in terms of like betting, it's not um, well one because money's not really a thing at this point. So uh, you're not. It's not really a lot you can bet on. However, there there is an example. For example, in the um, diary of Murasaki Shikibu, uh-huh. who is the writer of the tale of Genji, but she also kept a diary. She talks about how she went to this banquet that was held by this one courtier. And the reason why this courtier holds the banquet is because he lost a game of Go. So they, uh, they had bet on the game of Go for okay. who – and the loser would have to hold the banquet. So they would yeah, have to, yeah, you know, yeah. shill out and get their – let their – uh, house be open. But in terms of uh, betting on the horse racing, uh, not so much. Okay. Certainly not in the way we think about betting on horses nowadays. Um, sure, and sure, also, sure. I think during that time period, especially when, you know, riding a horse was actually still an important martial skill, like it had mm-hmm. a had a purpose outside of betting. Right. You know, true, I, I think true, today, true. I, the only thing you think of when you think of horse racing is betting on it. If you're not betting on yeah. it, I'm not, well, at least I don't have a particular interest in watching it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there, there's so many things I could ask you and I would love to read the dissertation <laughs> but when you're done with it. But I appreciate um, that. One, one, um, let's just, t- let's kind of wind things down and tie sure. it back to sumo here. But any, any kind of misconceptions, any things that you want to kind of dispel about sumo, be it like from a more historical perspective or a more contemporary perspective, you know, since people are listening, anything you want to let people know about? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, from the historical perspective, I guess the main thing that my, my research is trying to look at is, is during the Heian period, sumo is actually a political, it has a political function and it was competition like it mm. was it was i i call it legitimately competitive which does not mean competitive in a modern sense but it is competitive it the outcome was not fixed which is a very common misconception by people who have looked just at sumo or like mm-hmm. a lot of people try to what they'll do is they're trying to look at sumo over time and so they'll say well back then it was a ritual and it was connected with um agrarian rights and it was connected to shinto which anyone any pre-modern historian can tell you anything tied to the word shinto uh is very problematic but Mm. um they try to connect it to that and then as you move forward it becomes the sport it is today but also the reason why there's a lot of reverence today and the the all the rituals involved here's where the rituals come from that sort of thing and Mm -hmm. it's i'm not here to say that the that it wasn't a ritual. It absolutely was. But unlike other rituals in court, it did not have a fixed outcome. Mm. Like this is an actual competition. And they, uh, they cared about if the wrestlers were big and strong and actually like there are records of this wrestler didn't look very good. So we sent him home. Mm. Like, and if it was just a ritual, I mean, you wouldn't, at least I wouldn't think you'd need it, but sure. So there's that. In the modern sense, I mean, I'm quite a few years removed at this point, but I think the most important thing for people who watch sumo is the way wrestlers are on the dohyo, the the, the stoic nature that we are required to have is definitely not how they are off the dohyo. (laughs) Uh, These guys, they, they have personalities that just, you know, complete range of them. They, they go all over the spectrum. 
They yeah. enjoy going out for drink. They're incredibly fun to have at parties. Um, <laughs> There, a lot of them are very gracious with their time and their energy, and they care a great deal that you care. So, you know, when I was there, they could tell I cared about sumo, and in turn, they cared a great deal about me. Um, mm. <clears throat> and it is, it's a very tight circle, and it's kind of sure. hard to break into that. But once you do, you're in it. Um, mm. <clears throat> so a lot of those guys, you know, when they're wrestling on the dojo, a lot of them will be friends, some of them will not be. But the main thing is, even though on the dojo they're required to really not show any emotion, they really let that all out <laughs> once you're back at the Haya or once you go out for a couple drinks or something like that. They're great sure, fun. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I, I've I've only met one professional one. That was Konishki, like I said, oh, great fun. Well, and I've yeah. met one, uh, you know, U.S. sumo champion Ken Heffernan. Uh, yes, super nice guy. Just he such is. a lovely man. Just, man, just like I respect him so much. Just such a nice guy. So yeah. Um, and now you, so you know, I've only met really nice sumo guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, after you say those two names, I'm quite humbled because. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Konishki, what a powerhouse. And Ken, Ken and I have been teammates multiple times. Lovely man. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've had nothing but nice experience with, with people involved with Sumo. So mm. um, th thank you for making time, Colton. As I said, I am I am sincerely interested in reading the dissertation whenever it's 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 done. So. I appreciate that. I hope you do yeah, too. Yeah. Yes, and I hope so a few I'll other people will as well. We'll see. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. No, very interesting stuff. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I learned about Colton uh, through an article in the Japan Times. It was a great article, so if you want to go check that out, I will include a link in the show notes so that you can read that. And um, as I mentioned, that I got to meet Konishiki uh, quite a while ago, actually, in, in, um, in 2017, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 2017. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, and I did write an article uh, based on that because I, I got to interview Konishiki. And so if you're curious about that, well, I will include a link to that article. Uh, it ran in uh, Wasabi magazine, and um, I'm the editor-in-chief of Wasabi. But uh, unfortunately, right now, we're on hiatus, I guess you would say, because of the pandemic. So I've been working on a spin-off project, which is called Transmissions from Hawaii. That is a podcast focusing on stories about Hawaii. Uh, the latest episode is about a Japanese-American former Olympic swimmer from the 1950s. And <laughs> it's a pretty interesting story, I think. So if you're curious about that, well, hey, I'll include a link to that in the show notes as well. Um, that is episode seven of Transmissions from Hawaii. So link in the show notes for Colton's article, link in the show notes for <laughs> the article about Konishki, and link in the show notes for episode seven of Transmissions from Hawaii. All right. Um, if you have any questions or comments, send them over to mail at japanstationpodcast.com. Thank you so much to all the wonderful listeners who send me emails. I always love seeing a, a, an email from some random person there and I go like, oh my goodness, it's, it's somebody that actually cared enough to send me an email and tell me, you know, something about the show. It's always positive. So <laughs> thankfully I haven't had any hate mail. Uh, it's, if you want to follow me on Facebook and Twitter, of course, that's at Japankyo News. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. That is an immense help. Help spread the word about the show. Um, send the link Put it out there into the uh, social media ether, I guess you would say, or, or send it via email to somebody. Uh, and of course, if you want to support the show via Amazon, then go ahead and use japankyo.com slash Amazon. Won't cost you anything extra. And thank you to everybody who has been using that link. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to Yunomi for providing the opening and closing song, Oeda Controller. Uh, link in the show notes. That does it for this episode. Next one should be out right on schedule on October 15th. Um, I did not release a second episode of Ichimon Japan this month because I decided to use that time for a new Japan Kyo project that I'm working on. I can't say exactly what it is, but we should be uh, releasing info about that very, very soon. This is a collaboration that I'm doing with another uh, Japan-focused content creator. And uh, I am very, very excited about this. So um, this should be out later this year. We are coming close to um, releasing something. Um, 
but I won't give an exact date quite yet. Just suffice it to say that it's coming out very nicely and I'm very eager to get it out into the world. So as soon as I can, I will be talking all about it. I will be <laughs> bothering you guys and telling you to go do this or that. So um, yeah, you are definitely not going to miss it. I may even release a special episode focused on that project because, well, it, it, it's a big one. So anyway, more info on that soon. But uh, thank you for listening, and uh, remember, go find your miniature pony. Just do it!